This is episode 127 of the XY podcast with Hayley Knight. If you're not familiar with Hayley, you'll definitely be able to find her name in amongst the many conversations within the XY Facebook group. She's an ideas woman and a huge work-life balance advocate. She's got well over 10 years experience in financial services, and she's also the leading lady behind contract paraplanning services. There's so many great ideas discussed in this episode. It was actually really hard to summarize them all in this podcast's written description. Haley explains how to take a client's lifestyle and often intangible goals and successfully articulate them in a compliant SOA. She highlights the kind of advice process which she believes produces the best SOAs, and she also shares her top tips for advisors looking to outsource their power planning. We really hope you enjoy this episode, and as always, if there's something we could be doing to give you a better podcast experience, don't hesitate to reach out at xyadvisor.com. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Hayley Knight. Pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. You've uh, you've been very like, I think you, how did you come to attention? Emily said that like Haley Haley's going to be on the podcast. We've organised her to come on. She's <laughs> and like I I knew of you. I was like she she contributes a lot to the Facebook um, group. Yeah. I, I have a lot of questions for XY Advisor, that's for sure. I don't know how much I contribute, though. Um, but uh, I used to work with Verse Wealth, Corey Wassell. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's. I think that's kind of how he spoke to Emily and said, you've got to talk to Hayley with the power planning. So, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Corey does him. some cool stuff. Yeah, he's definitely one to watch. He's re- it's, it was really eye-opening to work with him because he's um, just... I've, I've never worked with an advisor like that before. Mm. Just his entire approach is amazing. So, um, yeah, I really value working with him. Well, I, I, like a lot of... I, I came into contact with Corey. Uh, I was in the, the finalists for the Rising Star at one uh, point yeah, with yeah, Corey. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was really great to sort of um, to meet him at that time. And then since, since knowing him then, it's just been awesome to see what he's gone and done because he's just... I can imagine he would have been quite challenging as a power planning uh, client because <laughs> he would have really wanted to challenge maybe what other people were willing to. He's like, but what about if we do it this way? I can imagine. Yes, it was definitely like that. I came from a background of, I'd been power planning for over 10 years at that point. Um, and I think in my first email to him, I said, look, I know you need a power planner. I can write plans with my eyes closed because I've, I've just done so many of them. And then when I started working with him, he was like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that old kind of school stuff. We need to reteach you <laughs> how to be a power planner. And, and it was really refreshing because Corey is an advisor that I thought a financial planner was when I first started as a power planner. I saw them as kind of like a like a personal trainer for your money. Mm. And in my experience, I didn't see any of that. So I thought, well, this is how it is. It sort and of got stuck Corey, within that compliance yes, framework. And- yes, yes. And, and like a real um, kind of product focus. Mm. And then working with Corey, it was like actually – we're focused on the goals. We actually really want to capture really good goals. And to write advice specific to that is just so, it's just really refreshing. Yeah, I mean, we should go into that because, yep. like, I think a lot of people really struggle with the, the concept of how do you, like, the, the more intangible goals. Mm. So the goals that you, you look at them initially and you sort of, you, it's hard to see a direct link if you're not trained in or yeah. you don't have a process of how you would go about it to the traditional toolkit of mm, advice. Exactly. What can you share with everyone <laughs> out there on how to do that? Like, how do you take a goal that's like, I just want to feel like it's one of those really intangible goals. Like, I like, I like, I like puppies or something. And yeah. I don't want to buy one, but I just like puppies. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can tell me the puppy. <laughs> but um, I say some of the examples that we work with were like um, clients who said, 
I might start a family in a couple of years. We might want kids in a couple of years. And that is not necessarily a financial goal when you think initially about it. But then when you dig down, it's like, actually it is. You need, you're going to have go down to one income. You need to factor in how long you're going to be on maternity leave, what that looks like. Um, and so I think everything kind of boils, boils down to being something about money, money as a tool to achieve a goal. Mm. Even if it's like um, something as simple as, I want to do craft classes. Mm-hmm. I really love craft. And it's like, fantastic. So they're going to cost this much cool well let's have a look at your budget and see if we can work out this and that can get you to your craft classes and then. segment that out exactly right? exactly so there's not much that doesn't have some kind of money involvement with it apart from a feeling i suppose mm. but um even that even then yes we could manage their money to give them the confidence to look for things to to make them happier so even if they're not clear exactly what that's going to be yet it's how do you get to them that's to that state where they can? Exactly. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. I'm, I'm curious about so like there's because there's a lot of different ways of power plan. Like there's a there's a lot of different I guess where, where the power planner sits in the process for some practices is much higher than where it sits. Like for mm. some structures, the advisor practically tells the power planner like the power planner is just pretty much following direct instructions. And there's no actual sort of um, extra layer of value that's added at yep. that stage. Yeah. I'm presuming, I don't think, from from meeting you and understanding <laughs> a bit more about you, I, 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 I imagine you would struggle to sit in that bucket. <laughs> but, it, but it is literally like it's like we've got to get this piece of paper done. Yeah. Done. Mm. Like I, I'm really interested in how where you sit along that sort of linearity and how like I'm presuming like once you started working with Corey for a bit mm. more you would have started to go okay so I know what he I can actually take it from this stage now instead of him being more yep. prescriptive and running with it yeah do you, do you mean me personally or as a power planner in general and the role in general you personally yeah and then also like maybe a bit of commentary <laughs> <laughs> I um I don't write plans anymore. I used I used to finish it up about a year ago. I more so manage the business now. But when I did do it, um, I very much enjoyed being involved in the strategy because that's what you learn. Like we most power planners have some form of education behind them as well. Um, and to be actually involved in the strategy with the advisor, looking into alternatives and things like that and actually coming together and go, yeah, I really genuinely think this is the best option for them. Um, it makes it a lot easier to write the SOA as well because you understand how you've come to those recommendations. Um, but I think I would say most paraplaners like to be involved in the strategy. Whether they're allowed to or not is whether not they're scary. allowed to exactly exactly because you don't um, like with all the education you need to well you should do as a power planner it's kind of wasted skills if it's just like here you go you know put this into a document now we you know we want to use our skills so yeah 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 I, I agree with you like if you've got someone doing something you might as well get them to do like add yes, value to exactly it. exactly you could just get an administrator to write like put together a document essentially mm. but a power plan is there to give their feedback like to bounce ideas off when it comes to strategy use their skills because it's like a, a um a second opinion on what you think maybe they think of something else that you haven't considered before um so yeah i i think i think often they're underutilized power mm. planners in general but um most power planners i know love the technical part of it as well Totally. Like, that's mm. how you gravitate towards exactly. that space. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm curious around, like, you, you would deal with a wide range of licensees. Yeah. And we can we can walk down this path and sort of talk about it a bit, <laughs> and, and I'll see what I can get out of you. Okay. But there's a whole lot of different re- compliance requirements. Yeah. Do you, do you see any correlation... <laughs> Between more compliance and better advice. No. Thank you. Absolutely um, not. Now what do I ask? Um, <laughs> I got my sound bite. <laughs> and then goes to business. <laughs> no correlation between more compliance 
and quality of advice. Well, it's good to know that uh, from someone that sees a lot of advice. Um, have you ever have you ever talked to ASIC directly about that? No. Would you, would you be game to? I would consider it. Yeah. I feel I feel as though I'm in a good position too because we see such a wide range of SOAs. Mm. Like we work for all different types. We we work for the big deal groups, the boutiques, the self licensees, the one man bands. We see all different types of uh, SOAs, and in my experience and what I've seen, uh, the more compliance in as in the more disclosures and disclaimers in an SOA, (laughs) the more bases they're trying to cover. Mm. Um, So it makes, leads me to kind of think, is there something being hidden deeper? Like if you had something, put it this way, um, if you were to explain something to someone, you would want to keep it as simple and clear as possible, right? To make sure that that message is conveyed um, easily to them and it's easily understood yep. if you then take that same message and then fill it with all this like this is how you um, you know plant a flower have plant a plant right um, but don't don't this use where this the seed oil. came from yeah. and is this it- <laughs> and um, be careful of this oh did I tell you about this maybe use this shovel and it just it's totally clouding that entire message and it's like hang on what was I doing what are we actually doing in the first place so the clearer we can make it and the simpler we can make it, I think the better, mm. which leads me to believe the shorter SOAs are the best ones mm. because they're straight to the point, they're transparent and there's no double up of what I call <laughs> fat or fluff in the SOA. Bullshit. You mean. Yeah, bullshit. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I said Impressive. I was going to swear. It's <laughs> not a real swear. Yeah. Technical term. <laughs> so yeah, I, I get you. Mm. I, I, I've always like this, this, there's, there's a correlation between a whole lot of wording that's come into these SOAs and, um, products attempting to be closer to advice than it should yes. be. Yes. Yeah. And we've talked to lawyers, we've had like lawyers on, on the podcast and yeah. they've said, like, if you look at ASIC, what they've said, there is the possibility to do what some of these clients that you've got do, which yep. is like a, a short SOA that's yep. easy to understand. Yeah. So why, why, why can't we do this? Well, um, this is something that I've, um, I'm actually been talking to people just about actually today. Um, and it, it, a lot of people are thinking along the same lines, um, taking the SOA, which essentially hasn't changed in the last, well, at least since I've been a junior power planner, which is 10, 15 years ago, this SOA hasn't changed. It's just this stagnant PDF document, right? Um, Taking that and going, this doesn't work. Clients aren't reading it. They can't understand it. And they're just signing it because they're trusting their advisor, right? If that's the case, why don't we take this back, start absolutely fresh and go, We've got so much new, amazing technology available to us. Why aren't we looking at this a different way? What can an SOA look different? Can we use videos, hyperlinks, live documents, websites, all of this stuff that we can use to communicate to the to the client, but still have something that's simple and easy to easy to read, if it's being read, um, easy to understand, and more than anything, compliant. Mm. right why can't we do that why are they still looking like this massive some of them are getting bigger yeah which just is amazing yeah i think i think these institutions reach into their toolkit and their toolkit at the moment to like when they have a problem and the toolkit at the moment is made up of compliance audit remediation legal yep there's not many um client advisor experience people sitting in that toolkit no that there's no I I don't think there's many psychologists sitting in that toolkit of actually a filter over everything going actually what's gonna what's gonna work yeah so the the issue you got there is that that is the toolkit that they're they're going to when they have problems Mm. or when they don't know how to deal with something yeah and because of the structure of that toolkit the solutions um, are coming out 
yes. as we've seen them. Yeah. One, I guess, one good thing is that I have seen. Um, I think I think there's a bit of a tide turning mm. because they've. I think, especially with the Royal Commission, there's there's increased acknowledgement that okay, well, okay, the the whole covering up of like mm. or like papering yeah. over. Um, I guess a more direct link to product than is maybe ideal sometimes. Yeah. Um, or the fact that the licensee is owned by a product provider, mm. papering over that with more wording mm. is is not. It's the lawyers are finally figuring out that it actually has no legal benefit. Yeah. So it's taken a while. Hopefully. <laughs> That pain gets felt more that that's not helping them because then maybe they'll start to release, like, start to drop stuff down because yeah. that's, it's just practical. I, you would think so, right? Like, I can remember one part of the Royal Commission I was watching, there's this woman up there, she was, her complaint was about, um, she didn't understand, didn't know what the commissions, insurance commissions, the advice I was receiving after implementing the advice. So she had a copy of this SOA. She had provided it for evidence um, to to them. And um, the person asking the question said, can I refer you to this page of your SOA? She flips through it and she goes, this, this is the disclosure of all of the insurance commissions. It's right here. Um, and this woman was literally just like shocked. She was just like, I didn't even... I had no idea dear, that was there. And when I saw that, I thought, you've gone through all these stages of complaint, right? Mm. All the way to get up to the point of being interviewed at a Royal Commission. Mm. And even still, you don't understand what's in the SOA. Mm. And that to me says, we have failed her blank, you know, blankly. It's if you, you would have read over this quite a few times. I can only assume she would have. And if she still didn't see an entire page of insurance disclosures, it's just like, wow, that Mm. is really, we've got this totally wrong, right? Uh, Which is kind of, I think this is instigating people going, okay, what we've been doing doesn't work. (laughs) Mm. Let's go back to the to square one and, and rethink this whole thing mm. um and I, I think you're totally right everyone a lot of people have already started a lot of people have already started the ball rolling which is really exciting to see oh it's so cool like the, some of the tech that people are playing with i, I am presuming and i can presume you've you've seen some of the new ways that you can yeah. present Advice. Yeah. What, what can you share? No, with? I don't. I don't uh, know much. Um, but Not necessarily technology, but maybe styles of presentation. Styles. So like um, even powerpoints. Like I used to. I used to yeah. take my SOA and mm-hmm. I used to go. That's a piece of crap. Um, like the bit that, like all the intelligence in there is great, but yeah. everything else that's in there was just. It's a technicality. Like I hated the thing. Like, yes. Yeah. Why would I want to put something yep. like that? So I'm like, okay. So what do we need to... You go through the compliance and you go, what What do you need to actually clearly disclose the client? That, that, that. Okay. That goes in the PowerPoint. Yeah. And then the rest of the PowerPoint is actually made up of the stuff that's yes. useful. Yeah. It makes it easy yeah. for the client to yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah. I um, A couple of advisors are doing that that I know of already. Um, uh, one of the really cool things that I've seen is uh, it's kind of like a live website, right? And um, you can put the entire SOA on there. Um and it basically tells you, tells shows you uh, exactly where the client's looking. Cool. So if they say if they're sitting on the fees, it will say how long they looked at those fees for. Yeah. And then okay. so you can get a gauge of what the client is actually looking at, what yeah. they're interested so you've sent in. Sending out to them digitally. Yes. Yeah. Digitally and um, a, a PDF, I think, still needs to be done for the technicality. But the uh, they're looking at potentially. Um, digital signing as well Mm -hmm. trying to get that through um but the you can yeah so basically it spits out a report to say yep cool so your client was most interested in this they spent x amount of time there they clicked on this video three times they Mm -hmm. watched it to this amount yeah so that also this is before the statement of us meeting or so you can do it at any stage this could be for your soa yeah right it could be your engagement terms Mm mm-hmm you know, um, this 
gives you so much information as to how to tailor what you're giving to your client because you can see directly what your clients are interested in, Mm. what they're spending the most time in. If they don't look at the SOA, you'll also see that. Yeah, (laughs) which probably happens a lot. (laughs) And it's another layer of compliance. Um, Speaking with the FPA today, um, they were actually telling me about um, the level of uh, to, you could use that to a point where if you're in a meeting uh, with a client and you've got this website open, right, and you're talking through and you're explaining the concepts with them, mm. if if there ever was an event where they came back and complained and said, they didn't explain it to me, um, I didn't understand this, you could have a report right there and said, yeah, actually, you could see we sat in that section for 15 minutes yep. in the meeting. So it's another – it's extra compliance yeah 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 Yeah. we've been we had like we had the we do our podcast in a bit of a grouping and we're talking about this previously it's sort of there's that gap in capturing a lot lot of the time advisors are are maybe like having the right conversations Mm, and it's just grabbing that information how do you grab the essence of what's going on how do you um capture it from a compliant record but and also for the power planner yeah and have it translate through the process so yeah. then make it to the SOA. Exactly. And that, I think, is... It seems like it's a simple thing, but that's... that's prob- Like, if you think yeah. about... And I'll let you tell me, but, like, I've always seen that one of the biggest problems when I was dealing with um, a power planner was me. Like... <laughs> and the thing is... And this is as an advisor, and I think, I think the thing is... And this is the challenge. A lot of advisors may not accept that that's their role in the quality of the outcome Mm. and it's and that's the bit that needs to like you guys can only do so much with what you're given Mm, exactly and to me i just continue to like i've ended up rolling into tech because i believe that most of the problems Mm. that um emerge down the rest of the advice process relate to a lack of data capture up front yeah and the um the context and the quality mm. and and like I could I could link most problems to that point. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. know how you feel about that. That's... Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's uh, speaking more f- so from an outsourcing point of view, the uh, we the way we work is we have the same power planner with the same advisor for the reason being is that they kind of establish a relationship. The power planner gets to understand the advisor's preferences in the SOA Mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier then for the advisor to pass over um, their their, um, recommendations to get the SOA written. Mm. But in the first five, ten SOAs, you'll see a lot of to and fro. Mm. It's back and forth because the power planner is learning uh, what that advisor wants. You could be working with the same licensee as you have 50 other advisors mm. but that advisor might like certain tables set out certain ways and that kind of thing and and i think that um relationship needs to have a lot of communication there especially if you want your soa customized and personalized really to that client mm. context is so important and and handing that over to the power planner you have to invest a fair bit of time to do to make sure that it's fully grasped because we're not in the meetings um, and it's it's hard to read through a final file note and go, I get it, I get the strategy, but I'm not sure how that client was feeling. Are they apprehensive about this? Do I need to how really far do you nail go with down the strategy? Exactly. How much how much education does this client have? Do I need to really really break this down, mm. or is it just high level kind of stuff? Mm. Um, so that relationship between advisor and power planner is really important. Communication is paramount. I think you're not going to get the yes away that you want until you have really strong communication with them. Well, it's, yeah. it's yeah often and. <laughs> I guess if you dovetail what I was saying with what you're saying there, it's um, if you can't if you can't fix the problem that I was talking about, you just gotta have a really good relationship. <laughs> <laughs> you can't fix that the advisor giving you better information. Then you just gotta really yes. learn to understand yes. them better. Yes, Ex- that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> another skill of a good power planner. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, I think you, you hear people that sort of go to a new power playing firm or whatever, they try a new one. And 
that, that yeah. what you're talking about there is like you can see how people would have bad experiences in that first like yeah because there's there's often a disconnect yeah it's like um we like to say to our new clients it's the same process as if you brought on a paraplanet in-house you need to train them like they have all the they've probably written a thousand soas before they haven't written yours so you need to train them about how you do things how you want your soas um, and there's going to be the teething process. It, it will be with anyone. Um, it's just trying to manage it and make it as simple as possible. Yeah. Yes, that's it's an ongoing battle. <laughs> but um, yeah, hats off to you for not just dealing with obviously the, all the advisor clients out there, but also having quite a team and the, all the people manage that goes into that. It's uh, yeah. yeah. I'd like to take credit for it, but it's really Karen and Sue that do all the work. I just do all the talking. Okay. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Karen and Sue. To be totally honest. Well, congrats, Karen and Sue. Well done. Great, Great business, guys. Well done. Yeah. Well, moving away from your business, the, the Royal Commission, mm. like I guess you hear, you would have seen a lot of the discussion for advisors and what they think about it and just general commentary. I mean, just like, just from like a power planning world, um, what are the things that you've gone okay now we're going to need to do this or now like what are the what are the impacts like how um i don't i don't think it it has really changed i think in as a result we've kind of received this we've got this uncertainty as well if an advisor is, has uncertainty about what his role, uh, you know, what the future of his role is, and his their firm is. I shouldn't say his all the time. Their firm is. Um, it's the same with power planner. Our job exists because the advisor writes the work, right? That's a good point. We, <laughs> so, like an advisor writing an article coming out saying seventy percent of advisors are going. You probably probably makes a power planner exactly. a bit nervous. Yeah, it's like, well, okay, uh, I'm going to have to find some new skills. But um, so I, I think there is a level of uncertainty. But it's kind of like, for me personally, it's just let's sit back and watch and mm. see what comes of this. I don't have a lot of control. Well, I don't have any control. It's more so I'm, I just want to see what happens. But in terms of um, what we've seen in the outsourcing world, because compliance is kind of ramped up, mm. um, we've seen things like um, licensees getting very tough on mm. outsourcers, like outsourcers that were fine beforehand now have to jump through all these hoops and mm. um, and more administration for advisors as well, just kind of taking all the BID forms and, you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So, yeah. And, and do you guys take on the best interest duty? No. No. <laughs> not I, not I our team. You. I do not blame you. <laughs> oh yeah, I, um do you wanna can you guys take care of that that thing that's got an endless um scope of liability? Can you can you take that one on? I I got other clients to see. <laughs> You must have been asked a lot. Um, every so often, but I think advisors know it might be probably pushing it a little bit. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting, um, like with the discussions you're saying with the FBA today, what, what sort of things are floating up mm. in these discussions? What sort of... We're really looking for... Um, uh, you, you may or may not know, but... Um, Myself and there's uh, four others of uh, uh, others of us. We're a group kind of putting together, I suppose, similar to a power planning version of XY Advisor. Okay. Right. Cool. Um, so uh, uh, Mel has created this um, Facebook group called the Power Planner Hub. Yeah. Nice. Um, so it, it's only I think about six months old, and we've got three fifty members, and it's very same kind of. Um, very same kind of environment as XY Advisor. Like, I've got a tip for this. Can you guys help me with that? Really community uh, yeah. kind of based. Um, and part of the conversation we're now having with um, associations is getting more power planners involved in events because traditionally they're kind of seen as, from a power planner's point of view, they're seen as um, 
for advisors. Mm -hmm. They're not really for para planners. Um, And we're trying to change that Mm -hmm. and get more para planner specific content, networking events, um, you know, tables at road shows, PD days, just uh, getting them involved in the community um, and just kind of providing an online resource for them. Very similar to to XY Advisor. You guys have have, have shown us how it's done. So (laughs) we're copying. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's really good. So that's part of the conversations we're having now with um, the associations just to get them involved in some representation and Mm. and, uh, that at the events. Yeah, because I suppose like there there is a disconnect. Like it's sort Mm. of, there's all this stuff that goes on Maybe you think about like advisors in their practices, like even whether it's outsource or in-source, mm. like the advisor goes or associate advisor, maybe mm. mostly that the advisor's going off to this event, Yeah, the stuff going on outside, the team's mm. got no idea what that's, what's going on out there. Yeah. And the advisor comes back and they say stuff to the team, whatever they've... Yes. And... Yeah. The team's just dependent on whatever the advisor says. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which, which, depending on the advisor, there may be a, quite a limited scope of what, what was available <laughs> to be consumed out there. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I, I, there's a disconnect. Like it's mm. sort of, and I think, like, I think it's probably looking at going, okay, well, power planners are in a position to really help mm. advisors help themselves. Yep. And yeah, how do you get them more involved? So they, so they're yes. more across, I guess... I think probably one of the biggest gaps is that, like we're talking about the context of mm. the front end, making it to that middle point where the yep. power planning goes on. Mm. How to power plan? Like maybe one of the things for you guys would be also be like, you, like maybe get a, or just come across to X Y advisor event, but get a <laughs> panel of advisors, and it could be all about like how um, asking about the conversation that goes on and learning about mm. things that translate to what they yes. say. Yes. Yeah. How can um, a power planner bring more value to an advisor as well. Totally. You know, do you want them involved in meetings? Can they take a bit more of a strategy? Um, you know, um, power planners have the skills. It's mm. just about making sure um, you optimize those and, and use them. Use them. That's what you're paying them for. So, mm. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's almost, it's a bit like advisors. So big, like the only solution for advisors, whatever happens over the next few years, doesn't matter if all the things get up in the Royal Commission or not is to adjust your business model. Yeah. Because technology, Mm -hmm. um, consumer demand, what people want, actually getting closer to the client and their demands, it's going to require changes in what the value proposition is. Yeah. And it it could be scoping out sort of different styles of services. Like a lot of people do cash flow. Um, Like there's a lot of, even just like having meetings that are just focused on like, like dream discovery and that sort of thing. Yeah. And the same with power planners. Like mm. What power planners can do, if you think about what, um, like, offices where they've got someone that's in the office mm. and they, they're they sort of in the meeting or they do... You, the outsource guys could do digital yeah. versions of that. They can yes. reach further into the practice and reach yeah. further into the value chain. and Exactly. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it, like, out loud. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. You could, you could even, um, yeah, go down the path of having, like, a... Para, as you said, power planner risk specialist or power planner super specialist, and they're the ones that advisors go to for very complicated SOAs or advisors who are only wanting to give risk advice. They can just go straight to that power planner, and there are some power planners out there I know that are just do risk, mm. um, which is and they're amazing at it. Yep. Um, so it could be just adapting to suit you know these little boxes of. What did you want to specialize? If so, cool. You've got a whole niche over here that you can service. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely. I think they can adapt. Well, it's yeah. There's a lot of parallels, like with the wise of things. Exactly. Yeah. Although, like, I don't know where you can go with this, but like, where do you think an advisor should stop in the process of niching? No, no. In terms of, so if you look at the advice as a linear process where mm. stuff has to be done, <laughs> where do you think the advice should just let go? And um, step to the side and wait until the power plan has done their job. Uh, yeah, I I really think the probably the most worthwhile use. The, okay, let me say again: the best SOAs I've seen come out typically come from power planners who've been involved in the client meetings. Yeah. Because they understand the client with the advisor, they understand the discussions. They can put more context, use that context, and and personalize the SOA. 
if the paraplan is not going to be involved in that advice meeting, I really think another good way of doing this is having that client meeting um, where you're talking about, um, you know, we've decided on what the advice is going to be. Essentially, you come back and have a debrief with your paraplanner straight away and say, this is the context. The advisor is really excited about this, but a little bit concerned about that. This is what I'm thinking. Can you go to go ahead and put together a strategy and let me know if you come up with anything else kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I really think if they can, it, that's probably the best use of the paraplanner's time. So the closer they can get to that meeting mm. and the advisor. Exactly. And and a paraplanner is also really good if the advisor isn't available because the paraplanner understands maybe those pain points or those points where... Um, uh, uh, clients might need more coaching. If the para- if the advisor isn't available, a power planner is just as skilled to have a conversation with them. Mm. It could be something, say, along the lines of uh, the the stock market crashed last night. Yep. It could be just simply like, well, the advisor's not available. Do you want to talk to our power planner? And they can talk them talk them through it as well, understanding totally. that context. So, um, I do think power planners can definitely be. Uh, you can get more from them out of the process. It's just about relinquishing the control. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Yeah. I, I've seen with a number of advisors that that is a bit of an issue. Yeah. And then they're whinging about how much work they've got to do and mm. because they won't give it up. Yeah. Just like you, you need to trust your power planner. Mm. They're qualified to do it and you're paying them to do it. Mm. You know, and I'm sure most of them would be very happy with that kind of um, opportunity because they also are growing. They're they're learning new technical skills as well and everything. Um, and and you know that's what they're there for. Totally. Yeah. What's uh, yeah? So guys, I mean, and girls, guys and girls, <laughs> let go. Let it go. Let yes. It go. Power planners there to help. That's. Uh... Yeah, I went through I went through a period where like I, I got to I, I realized that oh, okay. Yeah, I, I I get frustrated by the process quite easily. Yeah. So it was quite easy for me to just <laughs> and I think I might have gone too far, um, like in terms of handing Oh really? <laughs> yeah. I was suggesting. I was like, You got this, yeah? Um, <laughs> and um yeah, it it caused a bit more back and forth. But yeah. um but that, that person learned a lot. Yes. You know, when they worked with yeah. them. They learned a lot yeah. because I was I was the sort of on the opposing spectrum of yes. being very um, trusting and just going. That's yeah. a great opportunity for a power planner too though, to kind of um, especially for career power planners who aren't looking to become an advisor, that's 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 really great to be able to see you know, get a little bit more than what they normally would uh, mm. from the SOA. I think that's a really good opportunity for them. Mm, from an employment engagement standpoint as well. Like people always want to learn. Yes. Yeah. Keep challenging them. Mm. Keep it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What proportion of power planners do you think actually would like to ideally make the move to advice? Oh, really? Um, oh, that's a really tough question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would probably say as a really rough guess I would probably say a third okay. I think there's a lot of career power planners um, especially power planners who've been doing it for you know a number of years I think most um, people who are using it as a stepping stone to becoming an advisor usually are only power planners for a couple of years before they've got enough of a client base to become a full time advisor um, yeah, I would say probably around 30% is a mm-hmm. rough guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd, I'd accept that for sure. Like it's the number of people, like there's a lot of impediments to people making that transition. Mm. And I guess like, I think there's, there's probably people like in your situation potentially could have become an advisor. Mm, I tried it. He did. <laughs> okay. Well, look, tell me about that. <laughs> what happened? Uh, like, what? Um, I tried it. I had probably been a power planner for about six or seven years. And when I started this job, um, the advisor said, look, we, we want you, you know, to become an advisor, but you'll still write your own plans kind of thing. I was happy being a power planner, but I thought, Hey, you know, I've got the technical knowledge. 
you know, how hard can it be? Mm. <laughs> um, and then I very quickly learned this that I'm quite introverted. So for me, sitting at a table um, discussing technical things with a client and trying to explain it to them, for me, was like, oh my gosh, what? Like they're going to ask me a question, and then I, am I just confusing them, or it's it's just like <laughs> I I just didn't have maybe it was just a confidence thing, but for me. I did probably that for about two months and I went back to the advisor and I was yeah. like, listen, I'll write all your plans. I am not, <laughs> I am not doing that. It's not for me. I prefer to sit down and really think about the SOA and be able to put it together yeah. and explain it through the document get, <laughs> rather than <laughs> get deep. Don't, don't talk to them about it. Just yeah. get it done. <laughs> and I think, um, I think a lot of advisors are really quite relatively extroverted. They're people that like to sit down and chat and and are really good at explaining things verbally whereas a power planner i'm not saying they're not good at doing that but they they usually have better skills in explaining things um that are written it through writing so um well that's what i found for myself so it's it's a really interesting space that whole like what type of personality makes for a good advisor like i yeah. i when i started advising i like to an extent, I just I came in on natural extroversion, like just ability to just talk to people and yeah. like the stand the usual stupid dude um, false sense of confidence, just <laughs> no no apparent yeah. like foundation for it. It was just there, <laughs> and you okay, I can do this. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, I'll be right. <laughs> and you're there, and you, you end up doing it. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it does not mean it's a good thing just because it can be done. So, yeah. like, I think a lot of uh, um, advisors that are introverted actually do a better job. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, because introverted people are better at listening. Oh, good point. Good so point. So, when, you t- when, you talk, when you're talking about the explaining and things mm. like that, Yes, so the extroverted person would be more comfortable doing that, but the explaining isn't where as much of the value sits. That's that's right. Yeah, I, I've never thought of it that way. So I actually think, like, if, if you think about a lot of that, let's say that 30% of parent planners, mm. I think there's a lot of good advisors sitting in there. Mm. A lot yeah. of good advisors. Yeah. And um, I think there's that, there's definitely, um, I guess, the the gender side of things that come into play mm-hmm. and um, I guess uh, like Gary, the way the way men and women generally like obviously you can't yeah. generalize too much but there's certain characteristics that sometimes mean that that false sense of bravado or like confidence um, it's it's not there to, to lean on to get into that yes role if you yeah. haven't done it before yeah and like I like if you look at um, some of the female advisors come through, and like and even male advisors that were power planners as well, they become really good advisors mm. because they're, they're 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 much more <laughs> they're much more considered. Yeah, I'm sure their power planners really appreciate them a lot more than the <laughs> other advisors <laughs> because I'm pretty sure they put a lot more detail into what they're communicating <laughs> than um, these extroverted people yeah. that yeah. just out there having a good chat. Yeah, um, so. <laughs> I, I really do think, and I think I think all, like that power planning group. I really think that there's a there's a transition for a lot of people that would be in there to yeah. getting into advice. Um, people that um, I guess are more conscious of the compliance requirements. Mm. More um, like we can say that all those things don't add value. Yeah, and we and you can get most people agreeing. A lot of these things that we have that compliance requirements are. Yeah, but. <laughs> They're there, and they have to yes. be done. Yeah. And if you don't do them, you're, you're there's a word that we you're worried about saying you're swearing. Um, you're <laughs> fucked. <laughs> your licensee, your order, your order though, then your licensee, and then ASIC, they're not going to be very happy. So that stuff has to be done. Yes. So there's whether you, we 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 see value in it or not, there's a requirement to have that skill set to be able to yeah. actually pay attention to those details and get them done. Yeah. And. At the same time, huge value in listening really well to clients. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And some of the best advisors I know, they um, 
one thing that they are very good at listening at, with listening is um, I find a lot of them pause once you finish speaking rather than because they're instead thinking of the response then after you've spoken as opposed to while they're also listening and you're mm. talking. Um, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, you do Hey, it's, it's hard being an extrovert. Like, you constantly got this stuff that wants to come out and you just got to... What that example of what you're saying, you, you're... Um, it's like, you, like with these podcasts. It's, it's always like it's been... Like, much better than it used to be, but it's, it's, it is... It can be quite... It's, it's something you got to train, really train yourself to. Yes, yeah. To, like, keep your mouth shut for a little bit. Like, listen to the other person. Mm, yeah. <laughs> But like it's yeah, it's a really interesting space, and I, I really I, I've got a strong belief that there's that thirty percent is there, and like a lot of them could like really could be advisors. Oh, I yeah, I agree. I definitely think there's scope there. It's just a matter of them um, seeing it as an opportunity. I think starting from a power planner base will be them make them much better advisors as well because. It, when they do eventually have a power planner writing their plans, they'll know exactly what they want, mm. what they need to pass on to the power planner as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely something to pursue. I, the, the other thing to consider there is the education requirements. Yes, there a lot of them are well on their way. Mm. So you are sort of you are going. There's a, got a lot of people that are going to be leaving. And where are these advisors coming from? What, they're going to come out of uni? Like, they've got to study for five years or whatever, and yeah. then they qualify to be an advisor? They've got mm. a professional year? Mm. I, the, the, the closest source to closing the gap, because you would argue that there is a gap in the number of advisors. Yeah. Like, as much as people go on about, like, oh, the challenge of getting clients and things like that, Definitely, it can be challenging to get mm. clients, but the need is there. There's Absolutely. enough people out there that yep. need advisors. Yeah, they may not get to come into contact with the one that they're going to resonate with, or that has a value proposition that they connect with. Mm. But there's a need there, so these people they come from somewhere, yes. and then like the university standpoint is like it's a good starting point, but mm. there's still there's, there's a longer experience runway that has to go on. Yeah, I agree. So a parent plan, I mean, yeah, they it's could a save good... the industry. <laughs> We've always said that. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're like we already do. If we weren't here, you We've guys, <laughs> you guys would have been fucked a long time ago. Like, <laughs> I don't know how many times you have to tell you, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there anything you'd like to share about? Like, what's is there any events with this parent planning group that you'd like to share? To... Uh, not yet. We're still very much in baby stages. Um, we actually only just had our second meeting on Wednesday where we're talking more about where things are going and uh, what we're going to focus on. So, um, yeah, we're focusing on uh, basically building connections to get um, into events and things like that, getting the power planners going. We're setting up networking events um, and, you know, uh, training webinars, all that kind of stuff, all those um small there's smaller things that we can do that will gradually we're hoping will build momentum over the longer term but um we're we're in baby stages but i don't think it's going to take long to kind just, of take just off get out there and do stuff yeah. like as long as, you, as long as it's useful interesting valuable stuff yeah people gravitate towards that yes so, yeah like and you should just you, you've already come into contact with emily like yes. you got any questions Talk to her. She's, yeah. She yeah. understands how XY advisor works better than us these days. So she, she's amazing. She's amazing. She like she has often uh, answered a lot of my questions. So yeah, she's a good resource. Yeah, well, Em's awesome. Mm. But it's it's really cool. And we're, yeah, we're happy to help with this endeavor as much. Awesome. As Thank you for that. That'd Fine. be great. So. It, you've set up a good model for us to kind of copy. So yeah, that's the best way we describe it. Is like a power planning version of xy advisor <laughs> hey, whatever people understand that's a, yeah, it's cool could it be xy power planner maybe maybe <laughs> the sub license that brand it's all right we'll, we'll do a good rate for it so so the so your business that 
that you that you run with this mm. power plane business mm. yeah Tell so us a bit about it. I, I, my business is contract power planning services mm-hmm. so uh, we've been operating for now I think about eight years mm-hmm. um, it was actually founded by Lee Shadell. Um, was it originally? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, awesome. yeah, and I took over um, probably about two years after she had it. So back in 2013 or so. Um, and it's amazing. We've got uh, 23 power planners now. Okay. Um, two fantastic managers, Karen and Sue, who just saved my life. Um, and uh, yeah, we are all onshore uh, power planners. And the way, as I said, we work is we, um, the advisor has a dedicated power planner. So they have pretty, as much as they could be, um, they have like a direct relationship with them. The only difference is they're not in the office. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it works. It seems to work really well. And it's just, um, probably my favorite thing about it is that I really love, um, the freedom contracting gives like gives everyone Mm -hmm. um so uh, i have a lot of mums come to me going oh god i'm I'm about to finish maternity leave um i really don't want to go back full time do you have anything for me and just to go yeah we do and you can work from home and you can choose how much you want to work and you actually don't have to work with jerks and you know (laughs) (laughs) what are you trying to say here (laughs) you know it's we are as much for the power planners as we are the advisors. So um, it's... Yeah, it's great it's, for mothers in that situation. It's it's perfect. Um, and it, like we are people who travel a lot. Mm. And it's just like, cool beans, go, mm. go. And you can travel overseas and work, provided the licensee lets you do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I love it. Um, I myself work from home as well. And it's just, it's the ultimate kind of lifestyle business for me. Um, yeah. It's a good quality it. time with the kids. So. Yeah, yeah. And it, it gives you the freedom and the choice that you just wouldn't have if you worked full time and, you know, getting in to and from the office and, you know, those kind of demanding things. Um, yeah, I find the headspace that you get. Like, obviously, you've got to be a self-starter if you're looking yes. for You have to be. And yeah. a lot of, like, the, there is a lot of people that it just doesn't suit. They just yeah. don't yeah. have that, what you need to go, yes. oh, I've got work to do, let's do yeah. some work. But, like, the freedom of, because you're not forced to be a certain place, mm. you when you wake up in the morning, you're, it's a bit more of an adventure. Yes, it is. I, I totally I had to train myself to do it and I'm a quite a structured person um, when I first started working from home um, it was it was often like that I never had set an alarm because I can get up whatever time I can't anymore I've got kids they're my alarm clock <laughs> <No> but, <idea>. <laughs> <laughs> but before kids it was like get up whenever to- whatever time you want um, you know if you want to go and have coffee go and, go and have a coffee but you can't fall into the rut of doing everything that you want to do and then go, oh, I'll get to that work later. Mm. Um, I normally found that it was like, get just get the work done now and then take the rest of the day yep. to do what you want to do and have that freedom. Um, it's a it's a bit of discipline. It's kind it of is, like uh... kind of like going to the gym. You you don't have to go. Mm. You probably should. Yeah. And then after a couple of days of not going to the gym, you're like, well, okay, I really I have to go today. Um, it's the same with working from home. Totally. Things things just build up. So yeah, it is a discipline, but it's not. Um, it's you. It will fall into being a habit. Yeah. It's, you, yeah. But, uh, uh, one of the things I found challenging is sometimes um, scoping what you're doing in the day because you could, yes. it's easy to just let it blow out at mm. the same time and you do too much work. Yeah. That's healthy. Yes. For the day as well. Yeah. So it's that. The balance. It's that balance. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you're self employed, I think it's um, yes. it's a bigger challenge because there's always an unlimited. Yes set of things you could be doing there's always something to do yeah Mm. exactly right yeah yeah i find i used to find that um but now i just set like times where it's like at six o'clock i'm definitely finished um it's bed and bath time with the kids um but then um i can definitely i can go back in at 8 p.m 
um, if I really need to, um, but it's kind of, you know, that's the exception rather than the rule kind of mm. thing. So, um, yeah, I agree. It's, it is, it's really just a learned discipline, I think. You have to yeah. learn what works for you. How do you balance that freedom? Yeah, yeah. If people wanted to reach out to the business, where do they go? Yeah, um, a website is contractpps.com.au. Um, hit me up on LinkedIn. Send me a message there. Yeah, videos. I've seen a couple of videos for you. Have you? Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, they're very amateur, so the, probably the don't cool refresh that. <laughs> the cool power plant. The cool power plant. No, other power plant is doing videos on LinkedIn. <laughs> really? Yeah, just send the trend. Maybe there'll be more now. That's I was going to say, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, though. <laughs> that could be one of your content um, social media for the power plant. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, could, you could be like me. Oh, gosh. Wow. <laughs> I think a lot of those were recorded from my kitchen because there were the best lighting in it. Hey, it's authentic. (laughs) And those are my dirty dishes on the sink. But here I'm going to talk to you about (laughs) paraplaning. Well, for everyone out there, Hallie's a real person. (laughs) And it's been a pleasure having you on uh, the podcast. Thank thank you you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.